Um, it is one and a half after, so I think we are going to respect the time of the people who've joined early, and um, we're going to kick this off. So um, this talk is called Serverless on Your Own Terms. Um, it's mostly about serverless and Knative on K Kubernetes. Um, I'm Evan Anderson. I'm a staff software engineer um, on VMware Townsu, and I'm also one of the founders of the Knative project. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions after, or um, I'll point you to the Knative Slack or um, Twitter uh, for additional questions. So um, you've probably all been in this situation if you're engineers. I've got some code, and I just want it to run. And I, I'm kind of hesitant to just throw it out there because I know that it's gonna. I'm gonna have to make sure it keeps running. And you know, so if there's a problem with the machine or if um, you know, there's operating system updates or something like that I have to do. It's like, it's just, it's extra work. Um, and so if you're curious, all the code for this, there's actually two demos, one at the beginning at the end, all the code is here at this repo. Um, and with that, we're gonna swing on over to the demo. And let's see. So, um, what we're gonna do for this first demo is we're going to build a system to caption images. So I've got a, um, I've got an image here. Yeah, let's clean up. I did a pre-flight of all of this so to make sure it was gonna work. And uh, yeah, we've got an image here and we'd like to get a caption of it. Um, I'm just gonna come out something like that. Yes. I do want to delete that because we're going to do it over again. Um, and so we're going to use an ML model to recognize what's in the picture. And uh, to do that, we're going to start by finding an ML model. Um, and the best way to do that is we go over to our friend Google and we say, hey, GitHub, give me stuff that will do image captions. And we say, ah, great, there's a whole bunch of results. Um, well, a bunch of these look like people's personal projects, and I get a little nervous um, when I take a dependency on somebody else's personal project. What if they just walk away and get, you know, bored? But the, here's something that says it's an image caption generator, and um, I kind of think IBM is probably going to either archive this or make sure it keeps working. So let's try this one. Um, and we're going to go down here. And I know that IBM also works on Knative and works on Kubernetes. And look, we've got deployment options for Kubernetes. Um, that's pretty simple. Let's just copy this and go over to our terminal here. And I can do machine learning, ta-da. Um, now let's see. Okay, now that I've got this thing, um, yeah, okay, build and deploy, use. Oh, cool, it looks like it's got a Swagger API. Um, I'll spare you the details of using the Swagger API, but I'd like something that I can just um, use curl to throw things at, and I don't need to do a bunch of extra processing on it. So I've actually gone and built a little Spring Boot application here that takes an image in a post. Um, you can see down here, it produces a JPEG and it gets a request body, turns it into an image. Um, if it's a PNG, it converts it to JPEG. Um, it uploads it to the model here and then it figures out how much, how long the text, you know, what font size the text should be so that it fills up the bottom of the screen, um, writes the image and then sends it back. So um, we've got this here, and since I used Spring Boot Initializer, I've got a Docker file um, that I can use to actually package this up. So I can just say docker build um, captioner And so this is gonna go and build a Docker image. I've done it before, so you can see it's all tagged and nice and ready to go. Um, 
if I didn't, you'd probably see it build um, Maven for a couple of minutes. So I pre-built it so you don't have to watch that. Um, and then let's see. I also cleverly put deployment instructions in here. So this is where you're actually going to start to see Knative. Um, you can see before when we um, did this apply, this was just using Kubernetes resources and we created a service and a deployment and it said, okay, I've installed those. Now here we're going to do a KN service create uh, and we're actually going to need to do an update here. And this is where you'll see Knative works a little bit differently than Kubernetes. So you can see right away, instead of just saying, I created this stuff, or rather, I put this stuff here and maybe it's working and maybe it's not, Kubernetes will actually, um, Knative um, command line tooling will actually wait and make sure things are working and healthy. So um, right now it's telling you that it's getting ready. Okay, um, now the captioner is all ready to go. And we're gonna look over here. And I was clever enough to um, actually write out a command. Um, we will need to fill in a couple things because I called it target. And I've actually got, um, you'll see that Knative as well gave me a URL that I could use to reach it. Um, if we go back and look at this um, for Kubernetes, there's a node port address. So I'd need to actually know the address that Kubernetes scheduled this to in order to reach it. Um, and it's a little bit more fiddly. And so rather than calling it some image you found, picture, instead of calling it target, we're going to call it URL up here. I will discover that the magic of copy and paste is out here, maybe. Uh, oh, except I didn't pick the right name. Uh, JPEG is apparently spelled with an E here. Okay, and let's see, uh, an internal server error. There we go. Um, apparently, if you're lazy and you spell JPEG without a E, you're not MIME compliant and it doesn't work. But now we've got our captioned image and we can see it just popped up here. And since it's the same model, we'll probably see that it has the same um, the same recommended caption underneath. A man and a dog in, on a boat in the water. Um, I don't see the dog, but um, I blame that on the ML model, not on the captioning. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, we built a little web service. Um, Knative looks like it does things a little differently than Kubernetes. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about what's actually going on in the covers. So we've got two different languages and frameworks going on here. So I picked up this model from IBM. It's using TensorFlow, which is written in Python. Um, and then I wrote a, a Spring Boot application to wrap that API into the API that I wanted. Um, I use two different deployment methods. I use standard Kubernetes, which has a deployment for the code you want to run and a service for how you want to expose it on the network. And then I used Knative, which had just a single CLI that managed a bunch of stuff for me behind the scenes. Um, in both cases, I scheduled things through Kubernetes. Um, I used that open API definition to connect them on the network. Um, and the cool thing about doing this with containers and Kubernetes is that right now I'm running it on my laptop, but if I went to run it on a cloud provider or if I went to run it um, in a VMware data center with hardware as a service, it would work exactly the same. And so I can be pretty confident as I build and test and so forth that um, things are actually going to work and I'm not gonna run into some, oh, well, it worked on my laptop. I actually developed a lot of this on Windows and I had no concerns moving it over to my Mac for this presentation.
Um, so that's great. We just talked a bunch about Kubernetes. We talked a bunch about containers. I didn't hear serverless, serverless mentioned in there. Um, so I've heard three different definitions of serverless. Um, the key one I'm going to focus, focus on is the one in the middle, which is a platform that auto, automatically manages compute scale out. So you handle scaling up and scaling down and moving things around as needed. Um, that enables developers to focus on small units of work because they don't have to worry about the cost of deploying a service. Um, once you push it out there, it basically stays running and it's free. Um, but in terms of resources, it's very low cost. Um, and in terms of maintenance, it's very low cost. So it's close to free. Um, and the last piece is um, platforms that have pay per use properties. So where you're charged for each function invocation or you know each small request rather than, hey, you've got our VM running and it's been running for 30 days, so you're gonna be charged you know, $10 or something like that. And if you're in that latter model, um, it makes sense to pack as much as you can onto the VM. Um, whereas if you're charged for each function invocation, it may make more sense to just have a bunch of small things that run independently. Um, and um, if you have a bunch of small things that run independently, you can push them separately. Um, and you're unlikely to get them stuck to each other in funny ways um, that can be hard to debug. So a lot of people like this, you know, function as a service because each individual component is really simple and you can almost just integration test it and be done. Um, so what is, what are the properties that are managing this compute scale out? So auto scaling is built in. It's just a, you know, it's just available on the platform and a thing that you use. Um, similarly, scaling based on um, demand means that you need to be able to measure when requests happen. Um, and if you know that, you can also provide that as instrumentation. So you can say, hey, here's a graph of how many function invocations you have. Whereas if it's a VM, um, oh yes, thanks, Eric. Yeah, if you have questions, um, I may go through some of this kind of fast. And feel free to either use the Q&A or the chat. I'm watching both. Um, you, know, you can automatically get a graph or get logs pulled out and associate them with requests potentially. Um, also, the system usually provides some way of routing traffic in so that it can measure how much that demand is. Um, and usually, people use this to build microservices or stateless 12-factor applications. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about how Knative in particular enables that. For those of you who aren't familiar with 12-factor applications, this is a manifesto that was written about 12 years ago or so, I want to say, um, that uh, talks about how to build applications that scale out seamlessly. So you can basically, um, I like to think of it as, you know, oh, hey, I've got my computer. And when I need more computer, I can just grab it and stretch and add more processes. And then everything still works. Um, so case native serving provides serverless HTTP triggered containers. Um, and we'll talk about these components in a little bit. Um, so HTTP triggered containers means that um, these are HTTP applications. And Knative gets involved with this, your HTTP load balancer in order to make all this serverless stuff happen. Um, and this looks a lot like all the web applications you probably normally use. Um, a couple things that will trip you up is if you have like a file-based session cache that you expect to be shared across all your different servers, um, Knative won't really support that. So um, you probably want to package that state into either something like, um, like a memcache and give each client a cookie so that they can, you know, you take that cookie and you look up their session state. And so when they move from one server to another, um, their state transitions seamlessly, or um, just stick all the state in a cookie and send it to the user if you're not worried about them going in and fiddling with the session state potentially because users can change their cookies if they want to. Uh, so um, automatic scaling, we talked a lot about that. And it's pretty simple to auto scale 12 factor application. You just increase the number of instances. Um, in practice, however, um, just because something is easy in theory doesn't mean that you're actually going to get good results. So um, if you build a 12 factor application and you just run it on a VM, well, great, you're halfway there, um, but you need to count how many requests are actually happening and hook that up with something that will do automatic instance scaling 
which means you need start need to start getting familiar with the APIs for you know your vSphere or your EC2 or something like that. And your autoscaler is suddenly stuck to your infrastructure, and you need some place for it to run and read the metric and change the number. Um, and all of a sudden, you need another VM just in order to get your VM scaling. And um, it's a lot of bother. And so you just don't do it for small things because you're like, ah, it'll never outgrow this VM. Um, and it turns out there's actually a lot of opportunity there to save if you can share that autoscaler and scale things down below one instance. Um, so Kubernetes provides a lot of solutions to these problems um, because it has a built-in autoscaler. So you can just attach an autoscaler to something that you know has a number that you can turn up and down and it will look at a metric and change that number for you. Um, and you only need one, so you, you get to skip out on that, um, hey, I need to run an autoscaler that knows about my application. However, um, Knative makes this simpler yet, um, because Knative automatically has autoscaling just built in as a property. Um, if you remember that IBM deployment that I did, it had two things, it had a service and a deployment. It didn't have a horizontal pod autoscaler. So if we got a lot of traffic, we'd be bottlenecked on that one container. Um, and, you know, it's one extra thing you have to think about. In Knative, it's just there and ambient. And when, you know, someone asks, will it scale? You say, yeah, it'll scale just automatically. Um, also, Knative uses an HTTP-based autoscaler by default, which means that um, it knows when requests happen. And you can say, I want each container to get at most 30 or 50 requests or something like that, or one request at a time. Um, platforms like AWS Lambda um, limit you to one request at a time. And if you're trying to move code over, it's simplest just to say, hey, one request at a time. I don't have to worry about globals or singletons or anything like that. Um, and then um, Knative also supports the scale to zero. So one thing I didn't tell you out of the box, um, the Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler needs some place to actually measure how many requests are coming in. And if you shut off all the instances, um, you can't count how many requests there are. So you stay at zero forever and you just drop all your traffic, um, which isn't probably what you wanted. But if your app isn't used most of the time, you know, um, a great example of this is, you know, if you've got like an internal um, lunch menu application or something like that, it probably gets a lot of load at lunchtime. And at two in the morning, it probably doesn't need to be running at all. And so you could actually turn that off um, having a human do that all the time or having a cron job do that means that it'll be down when people, you know, go to look and they're not, you know, and it's not enabled. But with something like Knative scale to zero, it'll be off unless it's being used and then it'll be on and then it'll turn itself off again. Um, all this stuff is tunable, but um, for most applications, you shouldn't need to do it. Um, if you find you're needing to tune it, it's probably worth talking to the auto scaling team because maybe you know some of the defaults could be better adjusted or um, you know you found an interesting use case that they want to actually hear about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how that automatic scaling works. So let's say you're scaled down to zero instances and a request comes in. Now Kubernetes doesn't get in the network path really at all. So on Kubernetes, the request comes in, it says, oh, there's no backends, sorry, error. Um, but with Knative, if the request comes in and there's no backends, it'll pause the request. It will just say, I'm not ready to answer that yet. And it'll turn around and it'll say, Kubernetes, quick, I need a, I need a container running. Um, and so Kubernetes will start up a container. And then once it's up and running and ready to go, um, Knative will forward that request along and then handle the response. Um, and so that's how scale to zero works. Um, now we're going to talk also um, actually, actually scaling from zero. Scaling to zero, we're going to get into a little bit more of the details of what's really going on. Um, so conceptually, this looks like before, but you can see there's an extra space here. And that's because Knative has a component called the activator um, that it will put in place when it takes your last container out so that when requests come in, requests get, st get stopped by the activator. And the activator is the piece that actually goes and talks to, um, that goes and talks to the Kubernetes interface. And it turns out this is this is something you could build for yourself. Like this is all built on top of Kubernetes. It doesn't have um, special hooks, but it's hard to get this right, particularly if a request comes in while you're shutting down. Um, so Knative 
just bundles that up in a package so that you don't have to think about it, uh, which is nice. So we've talked a lot about how the scaling works. Let's talk about why we picked HTTP. Um, you know, Knative uses HTTP because it's a well-known interface that shares resources well. Um, and we'll see some of the magic that we can do because it's a well-known um, protocol that shares, that shares well later on. Um, also, HTTP2 is under continuous development and Knative is supporting a lot of those developments. So Knative supports HTTP2 and WebSockets. If you're into gRPC, um, which is a protocol buffer RPC mechanism that um, is part of the CNCF, um, that works over HTTP2. It's really just a special way of doing HTTP posts, uh, HTTP2 posts, and um, you can run a gRPC service on Knative with no problem as well. Uh, so if you, if you need to speak some other protocol, the advice I would say is if you want to use Knative, stand up a little gateway that converts whatever you've got into, you know, gRPC or, or WebSocket or just posts, if that makes sense. Um, and then use that to call Knative and you can do the rest of your development after that gateway on Knative. Um, the other thing is because we've specialized, um, that we know we're talking about HTTP and it's going to be exposed in a certain way. Um, a lot of the stuff that's in these Kubernetes YAMLs can actually get cleaned up a lot. Um, and the right hand side, you can actually take off the port name entirely. Um, and you'd be down to just saying my name and you know where the container lives. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see that the um, that there is a deployment and a service, and that this set of labels. Do I have my pointer here? I do not have my pointer. Here we go. Um, there's a set of labels here for app, my app, that gets repeated three times, and this target port gets repeated. Um, oh, and there's a bug there. So this would actually not work because there's no H2C port here. There's only HTTP. Um, I copy this from two different places, and clearly um, this is one of those things that you'd have to debug with Kubernetes. Um, over here on the right side, the Knative service just says, I want to run this Docker image. That's it. Um, so less YAML is nice, fewer chances of bugs, but that's not really magic. I promise magic. Um, so the auto scale is kind of magic. Kind of get to count that. Um, because HTTP shares nicely, um, you only need to do a single DNS setup for, um, for a Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can map a single DNS prefix to your cluster with a wildcard DNS record. And you don't need to touch DNS anymore. Um, you can just make up new host names and the HTTP router will handle it. So that's kind of nice, especially if you need to do a ticket for DNS, um, one ticket, and then your cluster set up, you know, for months, years. Um, there's a little bit of magic there. Um, another piece of magic is that um, as you're updating things and you're trying things, sometimes it turns out you push some software and it doesn't work right. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the uh, most recent Azure outage. It turns out that was due to pushing software that didn't quite work right and needing to roll that back. Um, so for, for stateless web applications, and I realize that Azure after Active Directory is not a stateless web application, but um, for stateless web applications, rolling back should be very easy. And Knative makes it that way because every time you make a change, it stores a revision of the previous thing and it's very easy to roll that back and put you know shift traffic forward and back um, so that if there's an outage your first answer should be let's roll back the last thing we did and see if that helps let's roll back to a known good state um, and then there's some additional stuff that's helpful for testing so um, this is an example of maybe a somewhat more sophisticated company um, being able to use Knative so they're serving um, a service named My Service, and it's available. They've mapped example.com to their Knative cluster. So they've got myservice.example.com, um, and 90% of their traffic is going to this release that's about a month or so old. Um, they're canarying 10% to this next release that's about two weeks later. Um, and they've put these two tags, um, one on Canary and one on a, a release that's just from a couple days ago that's called Head. Um, at this point, I would guess that 
head is kind of old unless they haven't really been been doing any development. But um, yeah, so they can reach this most recent release with head.myservice.example.com um, as a URL. But never, if anyone goes to myservice.example.com, will they ever see that code. 10% um, of users who go to myservice.com will see this um, September 11th um, pushed version of the code. And um, if you go to canary.myserviceexample.com, you'll always see that newer version that they're getting ready to roll out. And 90% of the time, you'll go with this stable production version. Um, and they can adjust those numbers over here on the left. And Knative will automatically scale the number of containers on the right to support the load that's requested. Um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes load balancing, Kubernetes load balancing uses the number of instances you have to figure out what percentage of traffic should go there. So if you roll out a new version that takes more CPU, um, it will start, you know, those instances will either be overloaded or if you start more, it'll keep just sending more traffic there. Um, with Knative, you can just say, I want 10% or I want 5% and um, Knative will handle making that actually happen. Um, oh, and one more bit of magic. Um, I liked holding this one for the end because anyone who's dealt with SSL and getting that provisioned um, knows that there's some special joy involved there. And Knative um, can automatically provision certificates for all those DNS names that you're you know, declaring. It, if you're publicly exposed, um, it can use Let's Encrypt um, and it uses integrates with Cert Manager, which is a common piece of Kubernetes infrastructure for getting certs. Um, using the ACME protocol. So if you have your own um, private ACME registry for your own certs, that would work too. Um, but this makes it really easy to actually go and um, start up a Kubernetes cluster and get SSL running on it. And then um, SSL is a requirement for lots of things nowadays. You'll see that um, I'm, I may get a browser warning one or two times um, or you know, a browser, hey, type of thing because I'm using HTTP. Um, certain domains require HTTPS. And um, if you're running like a webhook for um, like Google Assistant or Alexa or something like that, those require that the endpoint or GitHub, those require the endpoint be SSL. Um, and so having SSL just set up and managed for you is really nice. Um, so I kind of, I've pitched you a bunch on what um, Knative serving can do. Now let's talk a little bit about what Knative eventing is. So um, let's go back. Um, Knative eventing is really just cloud events over, cloud events over HTTP. Um, what is cloud events then? Well, cloud events is um, a CNCF effort to standardize the metadata about events to help with routing and logging and building common tools to process events. Um, a lot of the event ecosystem today is fragmented across, you know, oh, some people are using Kafka and some people are using, you know, AWS Kinesis or GCP PubSub or RabbitMQ. Um, Cloud Events tries to have a standard way to express these things. So you can route things from one to the other in the same way that like email or um, HTTP, you can just work across different types of servers. Um, and Knative Eventing basically brings all this onto Kubernetes so that you can speak cloud events um, over Kubernetes easily. And it does this with a concept called the broker. Um, and the broker is a central place, like a bucket that you dump all your events into. And then all your consumers can, can, can take things out of that bucket based on filters that they've set. So you say, you know, hey, all my events go into the broker. And then maybe this top application is interested in all storage puts, for example, all object storage puts, maybe from two or three different buckets. Maybe it wants to limit it to a specific bucket. Maybe this bottom one is interested in all audit log events. Okay, and then um, the broker is basically a way to make event delivery really easy. So for publishers, all you need to do is post a cloud event and the broker should be very high availability. So you shouldn't need your own local internal buffer for these things. You just push it out and with very, you know, with very high probability, it just accepts it and it's done. And if not, it tells you, you know, access error, please retry and you just retry locally. Um, for, for subscribers, um, you don't need to coordinate with 
who's publishing these events, you can just say, hey, I've got a broker. I'm interested in events like this. Someone get them there. And so that makes it really easy to refactor your event-driven workloads and say, you know, hey, I'm going to pull these in a different way. Um, as long as you're publishing with the right signature, nobody else needs to know. Um, and it's easy to subscribe to several different events with one function um, or to take one event source and only get like a third of the events. Maybe you have an audit log that has all creates and updates and deletes. And you're only interested in deletes. Um, Broker makes it easy to filter those out. And it does at least once delivery. So until you've actually acknowledged the request, it'll keep sending them. Um, and so this is what it looks like to send a cloud event in Java. Um, there's, you know, the cloud events um, group has published a library and you basically create a cloud event. Um, you have an HTTP message factory to actually, you know, turn this into an HTTP request and then you just use a send, uh, an HTTP client send. So it works with multiple different libraries. If you're not using uh, the built-in Java HTTP client, it has bindings for Vertex and like three or four others. Um, the other way you can get events is Knative ships with a bunch of built-in event sources. So you can say, you know, hey, I want to read from Kafka. I want to read from the ops log topic. And um, here's where my Kafka cluster is. And you don't have to write any code for these. Um, these are just shipped either by default or there's a catalog of additional things because, um, you know, hey, install this thing. It's lightweight. And by the way, it concludes a kitchen sink. You know, lots of people don't need all these different types. So, um, and some of them are actually maintained by, you know, independent groups like Google maintains its own stuff that integrates with Google's cloud. Um, subscribing to cloud events is similarly easy um, with the broker. You create this object called a trigger and in the trigger you say, you know, this is the type of event I want and, you know, any other attribute. So in this case, source is an attribute and this is coming from our production environment. If our staging environment also puts things, you know, puts in user updates, I can filter those out. Um, and I'm delivering it here to a Knative service. Um, but you can also um, deliver things to uh, a Kubernetes service or just to even to a URL. So if you have a VM for processing your events, you can still hook it up with Knative eventing. Um, so I covered a little bit of why this isn't just Kafka or Nats or RabbitMQ. And part of the answer is, hey, look, there's all these different things. They're all work a little differently and have different durability properties, but the core model that you use is pretty similar. Um, and there's actually two models that Kenya of Eventing supports. Um, one is a simple fan out. So like a Kafka topic would be, um, or certain types of Rabbit, RabbitMQ exchanges. Um, the other is a broker, which is which looks at the content in order to do the routing. Um, and it's more like certain types of RabbitMQ exchanges or doing a bunch of extra work on Kafka. Um, you know, so skipping over messages you don't care about, for example. And um, the nice thing here is you just, it just becomes an infrastructure primitive for you. And we can optimize how that's implemented on Kafka and RabbitMQ and so forth, separate from your worry. Um, the other thing that we try to do to make things easier is oftentimes when you're building these event-driven architectures, you go and do something and then um, you know, there's an event and someone processes it and then they're like, hey, there's another event. Um, rather than making them need to know how to send the event to the right place after that, um, Knative uses the HTTP response mechanism. And so when you send back an HTTP response of a cloud event, um, that will get routed back into the system. If you're using a channel, it'll, it'll get routed based on your subscription to a new channel. If you're using the broker, it'll get put back in that broker's bucket and someone else can select that event. Um, so you can see here, I've just done an example. You can actually see what a cloud event looks like. Um, it's just a bunch of CE prefix headers um, for the HTTP mapping. And then the payload is the HTTP body. And with that, um, let's show you the second half of this. So we're actually going to build a um, Twitter bot that will find image posts and um, post the images with captions. So we've got the convert an image to a captioned image piece already. 
Um, there's a few other pieces that we'll need. If you look in the um, if you look in the GitHub repo later, you'll see documentation of all these pieces. But basically, um, we have something that I wrote in Node called the image extractor that takes a tweet um, as a that's sh been shipped as a cloud event where the body is just Twitter's here's a tweet um, JSON and pulls out the first media URL. Um, fetches that and converts that into a new response with just that image in the cloud event, which we can then feed to our image captioner, um, which will respond back with another cloud event that we can send to um, a pre-built component that sends tweets based on if, you know, the content of a cloud event. So um, let's see. So the image extractor um, in this case, this is using um, cloud native build packs to be able to build an image. I've pre-built the image um, because watching me build software didn't seem like the best use of your time. Um, if you're curious later, you can go in and play with it. Um, well, I already created this earlier. We can do an update and it will load the image. Um, so that's one interesting thing with the KN commands is they distinguish between create and update. Um, Kubernetes, you often use apply, which just says, make it be this way. Um, in some cases, you actually care about, you know, oh, I'm creating this or I only want to update this thing. Um, the KN tool has an opinion here. If you don't like that opinion, you can also just write out your resources as YAML and do a cube control apply. Um, you won't get this. Um, you won't get these steps reported and the URL of the service at the end. If you use kube control apply, you'll just get, you know, service created. And then I've got a. Um, I've got the sender YAML. Um, this is actually from another, um, from another Git repo because it was prepackaged. Um, and uh, let's see. Let's see if you look at the README down here, there are links. To the Twitter source, um, and I just pulled out the sender and search source and put it over here so that they were easier to find. Um, and so the sender you can see is just a standard deployment and service Kubernetes type of thing. Um, Let's look at the search sender for a moment, um, or the search source for a moment before we get going. And we're just going to change this to cat photos. And um, yeah, so this is just some YAML that was there. And we're probably going to update this after we create it. So. Okay, and so this will create um, this will create a um, container source, which basically just says run this container, and um, it will send events, and um, it fills an environment variable that says where the event should go. Um, and this is Sockeye is a tool that ships with Knative um, that basically just lets you view what cloud events are sent. Um, and so you can see here that we're getting these um, twitter.com tweets and some of them, this one has no media. So that's not going to be interesting. Um, this one has no media as well, but you can kind of get in and see, hey, look, this one has media. And so this one has um, probably an image. Let's see. Yeah, you couldn't see that because it scrolled by too fast, but it has a JPEG in here. So um, if we look in our cluster now, we can see that all sorts of stuff has started up. Um, we've got Sockeye running. We've got the tweet extractor running. Um, we've got the captioner running. For those of you who are wondering where Sockeye was, it's a Knative service. So you didn't see the pods earlier because it was scaled to zero. Um, and Sockeye is actually using a WebSocket to stream these cloud events back. 
right, so now if we go over here, uh, and we go to, I've got the bots um, Twitter home up over here. And hey, I added a caption. A cat is laying on top of a bed. I could believe that. Um, so look, we've, we've built a Twitter bot and we only needed to write about half the code. Um, let's see. There's another one. And here's a cat lying on a couch. Cool. Okay. Cat looking out a window. Black and white cat laying on top of a table. Maybe. Um, so yeah. Uh, let's go back now and talk a little bit about what we actually had. Um, I find having a picture of these things helps a lot. Um, so here's what we're doing. We created this container source um, that was a prepackaged Where did my mouse go? Um, we created this container source that was a prepackaged thing that someone had built as a source. We loaded it into the system. Um, it pulls the Twitter API and sends events to the broker. Um, it sends these tweet events to the broker. We then have this Node.js image extractor. Um, that's pretty simple. It basically you know, pulls out the media if it's there. If the media is there, it sends a response event. Otherwise, it just says, OK, I saw it. Um, and then that media event goes to our captioner. Um, and the captioner um, calls that, that IBM image captioning service that we just loaded in. No, that was somebody else's code. Um, calls that over a synchronous HTTP call, and then returns it back as an event to the broker um, and the broker routes it back to a container source or back to something that shipped alongside the container source that sends the tweets. Um, so five stages all orchestrated with the broker um, and two pieces that we really built ourselves, the image extractor and the captioner and two pieces that we picked up out of the ecosystem because they did pieces that we wanted. Um, this one we built in it. Th these two were basically just adapter pieces. Um, which is nice because then you can uh, you can focus on delivering the value that is adapting. You know, someone solved a hard problem to here's my business need. Um, and so the other thing I didn't show you before, um, we have three triggers here that do that routing. And so the first one um, is fetch the image from the tweet. And so it's looking for tweets from twitter.com and it sends it to the tweet extractor. Oops, do not click. That will take us to the next slide. Um, the next one is um, captions the image. And this takes all the Twitter image, um, you know, all the Twitter image events and sends them to the captioner. Um, it doesn't really worry about the type. And then the last one is, um, you know, actually does this tweet sending. And it does that by finding all the captioned images that were emitted by the previous step that are JPEGs. So if for some reason it produced something else like an, like a, mp4 uh, file um you know we would just say oh you know skip those we're not going to send them to the tweet center because it only knows how to handle images uh, and you can see that the tweet center is actually a kubernetes service um, i could also have used a url there if i had something that wasn't even running on the cluster um, so pretty cool nice to be able to build this stuff really fast and easy and just have it go um, let's talk a little bit about how development in a serverless world differs from maybe the traditional development with like a JBoss application server or something like that, or even Tomcat and Spring Boot on tabs. Um, so for serverless, because the maintenance cost of services is so low, um, generally it helps to make your code smaller. So build smaller functions, really build microservices. Um, this has a couple of benefits. It reduces your cold start time because you've got less stuff to load. You've got less code to load, less stuff to initialize. You may not need to, in, you may not need to initialize all the backends and all the different functions. And so you can just skip a whole bunch of work there, um, which means that when you auto scale, every time you scale up or down, um, your customers aren't waiting for that instance to come online as much. Um, 
since these things are so small, the impact of a global isn't the same as if you're being loaded into, um, you know, a big instance with a lot of other pieces of code that you don't know about. Um, you know that you're just going to be small and you're going to get shut down quick. So, um, you know, use it can be reasonable to use a global for stuff like your connection pool because you know it's not going to last for very long. Um, the other thing to mention about connection pools is be careful about them because serverless does scale. Remember how you could take that server and pretend, you know, make it go whoop horizontally um, by start adding more processes. Each one has its own connection pool. And if you have a backend like a SQL server or a Postgres database um, or an Oracle database even, you know, the, the connection pool limits may be pretty low there. And if you say, hey, look, I can start a thousand serverless instances in, you know, 20 seconds. Um, that's great. Can your backend handle a thousand connection attempts or 2000 connection attempts? If you say, you know, start a connection pool and have two connections open at any time so I can send commands down both. Um, Knative Autoscaler um, has a couple things that you can use to tweak there. One is that container concurrency I mentioned, mentioned back at the beginning. So you can say, hey, each of my containers can handle 50 requests at a time concurrently or 30 requests at a time concurrently or something like that. Um, and that means you'll have one thirtieth as many instances, um, which will mean one thirtieth as many connection pools. The other thing you can do is you can set max scaling limits. So you can say, oh, never start more than you know two hundred because all the ones after that are just going to be load on the database. Um, they'll be unable to get a connection, and they will just make everything worse. You can get into kind of a death spiral here, where you know the front end gets slow uh, or the back end gets slow, so the front end spins up more instances that pound on the database. Um, make the database get slower, and then, you know, okay, spin up more instances to respond. Um, and so Knative has a couple tools to help you avoid that. Um, and the small units that we talked about at the beginning, um, you can get built-in observability by just saying, hey, how long does it take for this little component to execute a request? That's your first level, you know, how many errors come from this component? Um, that, that's your first level monitoring. Now, you'll still need to do more detailed stuff, particularly if you want to track business metrics. But um, as a baseline, is it alive? You get a lot of that for free. Um, so build small things, I just told you. Um, when does it make sense to break that rule? Um, if you've got a lot of stuff to measure, um, you probably want to uh, bundle it up so that it's all in common. And then the last thing to talk about is how to send good events. Um, you know, it's a little bit of an art here. Your payload, um, should be useful to the client so they can just do work without having to call you back. Um, all your data should be in the payload, but take the stuff that's interesting for routing and repeat it as cloud events attributes so that the broker can send things to the right place. Um, if you're in a regulated industry and you're dealing with PII, you're like, I can't send all that data. You know, that, you know, who knows where that'll go? And it has people's addresses and stuff. Or if you're worried about GDPR, um, that's when the claim check pattern helps. So in that case, you send a reference and you say, if you need to know the details, call me back, I'll do an access control check, um, and then I'll give you that information and I can keep that more tightly controlled. Um, also, if you have large objects, like someone just uploaded a gigabyte of logs, you don't wanna send the gigabyte of logs, you wanna send a pointer to them. Uh, and remember how I said you could use a URL or reference other types of things? One broker can forward to another if you wanna like split off part of your, you know, part of your events to be handled in another um, Kubernetes namespace. And so that's pretty much it. Um, I've got two slides here at the end. Um, just to point out, you can run it lots of different places. And this is really an eye chart for um, those of you reading this later, um, looking at the notes later. Um, it gives you a little clue as to how to get your Kubernetes and how to get your Knative in those different environments. So with that, um, thanks very much. And if you've got any questions, um, I didn't see any come through yet. Um, but this is it. Uh, this is your chance to ask questions. And yeah, if not, um, slack.knative.dev will get you to the Knative Slack. Um, Knative.dev will get you more information about Knative. And um, I've included a link as well to these demos if you're curious. Uh, Oh, when to use, when to use um, Taz and when to use Knative. Um, I'm gonna start with that one and I'm gonna answer the GA question. Um, so Taz is a full featured 
toolkit for building particularly Spring Boot applications, but it works with Steeltoe and other um, things. And it provides a lot of services like service binding and um, authentication. And it just bundles everything up into one complete experience. Knative is a lot more um, componentized and it's a lot newer. So um, I would say Knative is a good choice if you're looking to build on Kubernetes. Um, you know, you've made that decision that Kubernetes is where you're going to go and you don't have a lot of existing infrastructure investments that work on TAS. Um, and at VMware, we're looking actively at how do we make a bridge between TAS and Knative so that you can interact in these two worlds smoothly. Um, and today, that's not quite as smooth as we'd like, um, but uh, expect to see good things coming forward. Um, and so I would say if you're using TAS and you're happy with it, you shouldn't switch. Um, if you're not using TAS and you're trying to figure out, you know, oh, hey, I just need a little bit of that serverless stuff. Um, Knative is a good lightweight choice um, and it integrates well with Kubernetes. Um, so if you're, already in, if you're already in on Kubernetes, but your developers are finding it hard to actually get stuff to work, um, that's another good reason to um, switch to, to Knative from Kubernetes. Um, and then this next question is, is Knative GA? Um, yes, uh, both serving and eventing have shipped V1 APIs. Um, you'll notice that their release numbers are still 0. You know, X and 0. Uh, you know, I think we just shipped 0. 0.18 this week. Every six weeks we ship another release. Um, that's mostly because it's taken a long time to work out um, issues like trademark and um, what does a release look like. And I expect that um, a 1.0 would have answers to questions like, you know, if you want to repackage and sell this, how do you prove that you're conformant and that you can use the use the Knative marks correctly? I'm going to mark that I answered that one live too. So, any other questions? Okay, well, um, thanks you all. Thanks all for attending. I will stick around here if you do have any more questions. Um, but I realize there's also another presentation that you may want to get off to next.
Okay, I am probably going to close out this stream now. Um, thanks all for attending and um, please do answer the survey questions and send feedback. Um, I'd love to know what you thought.